I've lost over 15 grand four separate times, I think. Four separate times? <laughs> yeah. That was one. Or over 10 grand. Someone stole 30 grand from my storage yeah. unit. He's they went super... to my storage unit the same thing from eBay and nothing was in it. I remember buying these in a bar one night for like 160 a piece. They sold for 400. I'm like, this is the biggest hit ever. Held probably close to 20 grand of my inventory hostage. Someone stole 16, 15 grand, whatever it was. And this is the buy cost. The sell cost, this was like over 30 grand. Crap. Like, this is like, I'll go to the police station and have like a full nail on We're like, don't pick up the phone. I wired them like $18,000 or something. And the potential on this one was like 40K. Man, you're sending $700,000? of stuff to like some random stranger never met. I'm out in the field for now. They shouldn't get too damaged over the flood comes. They lose hundreds of thousands of dollars of people's stuff. What is up guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Side Hustle Experiment Podcast. Today we were going to have a guest but had to pivot last minute. So today, Drew had a great idea. We're going to talk about horror stories, the dark side of Amazon, uh, basically how we lost tons of money um, doing things, really learning things, um, and just kind of breaking down kind of things that could go wrong, uh, selling on Amazon, and kind of what we learned about it. Everything is fixable and figure outable, and we're going to kind of show you that today. Um, and this is kind of a really a look at... We probably don't, we're weirdly excited about this episode. We're basically talking about how we failed, which is kind of weird, but we feel it's important. Um, so we're going to drill down into that today. What's up? Yeah, I think if, there's not a lot of, not of people that talk about that kind of thing. And I think the big stories of large losses and money usually don't just happen from the big things. They're like yeah. little builds up, build ups of other things, like a snowball. So you guys might catch yourself in these little situations and, uh, yeah, maybe you can avoid losing some money because I don't know how much money I've made on Amazon over the last four years, but it's probably close to a million dollars in profit. And I don't even have close to that because of all these little losses here and there. And I guarantee that's the case with many, many sellers. It's just not talked about much because it's not very pretty at all, but it does make for good stories. So hopefully you can learn from that. Yes, sir. Do you want to start off? Oh, man. Uh, you you start off, you have like, you, you said you had a good one. I feel like that one's unrelated to anything I'm going to talk about. So oh, yeah. that'd probably be good. And I can just pivot off that if I, if something brings up in there. All right. So I'm going to start off with, so when I had the book business, I had a warehouse, if you guys don't know. And sometimes when you get Gaylords of books, usually there's also mixed media in the books. So there's like DVDs, CDs, and these are usually, you laugh, CDs and DVDs, like who listens to that stuff anymore. There is some huge money to be made on just some of these random, because they don't make them anymore. Um, so just through the grapevines, I was like, wow. If I... So the one reason I wanted to get just CDs and DVDs, they're extremely hard to find in bulk. Um, and I was just asking around and I was like, oh, like, do you, does anyone know who sells these? I wasn't being that person, but just kind of networking through to see if I could get these in bulk. And the only reason I did is because I knew I could liquidate all the bad stuff. So I had some guy I used to work with. This guy was a beast. He was, I think he was in his seventies. He had like four types of cancer. Like he was running flea markets. So he'd buy all the DVDs I couldn't buy. Like this guy was so smart. Like I was thinking today at the gym when we were, you suggested this, I should take him out to lunch and just like pick his brain. But this guy is just amazing. But anyway, he'd buy all the DVDs and CDs that I couldn't sell on Amazon, like no question. So he'd pick up like a Gaylord and it'd be, I don't know, four or 500 bucks. And I think the load was 1600 bucks. So I was like, this is a no brainer because I could easily make probably double my money off of just him buying the duds. So I work out a deal with someone um it was a new supplier i got it from a friend uh who had a he had a huge operation kind of sold it and then kind of started working for a buyback company and he hooked me up and he's like this person's great i'm like awesome we get to talking and they were really pushing me to get a full truckload so a full truckload i think is 44 <laughs> gaylords and i didn't have a forklift i just got the warehouse 
And I was like, I can't do that. I don't care. Like, I just want 12. And I was like, I, I, the truck needs to have a lift gate. So they were like, okay, no problem. We're going back and forth, like, through text. And I was just like, okay, great. Let's. And there was, like, a couple delays. The delivery is supposed to come today. It's not coming today. Back and forth. There's just something. Something is going to go really wrong. The truck rolls up, and there's no lift gate. So for any of you guys who don't know, if you have a Gaylord in a truck, usually a truck that has a lift gate, it will, like, come up to the truck. You could roll a pallet off. Then the truck goes down, and you just wheel it right off. So these each weigh about a 1,000 pounds each. So now I don't have a way to get them off the truck. I'm super emotional, meaning like pissed off. I'm not like crying or anything, but I'm just, this is absolutely insane. I text her. She's in a meeting. I can't help you right now. I was like, we have to talk tomorrow. So it's just me and this guy. And he's, I have another load. I got to go grab it. He's like, you need to get these off the truck. And this was like the first time I've ever been in this situation. This has never happened before. So I was just thinking, I was like, I guess I could hand unload it. And it was just me. And there were probably 15 to 1600 individual CDs and DVDs in these. And there's no way that you can't dump it over. It's just too heavy. So me and this guy spent like five or six hours literally unloading cds and dvds and he was pissed because he thought he was just going to drop off and he had like other deliveries and other pickups and as we're like putting the stuff in the gaylord he's just like chucking it so like all the cd cases are breaking it was just an absolute disaster and going through it i realized that this lady sold me someone's duds so duds meaning these are terrible like someone already went through all this stuff and this is what they decided not to sell on Amazon. And the only reason I knew is because they had like stickers on the Gaylords that said like trash or recycling. It was a mess. So there was just like broken glass. I was, I think I stayed at the warehouse to like midnight, just kind of going through all this stuff. And it was an absolute nightmare. It, it, I just like thinking about today, it just makes me so mad. Um, I ended up not paying her for them. We got into a huge argument. Um, so, okay. So a couple of things I learned from this is one, just because you can't be, I wasn't mad at the person who recommended them. Um, cause you have to take responsibility for your own thing. Anything you do something, if Juice says, Hey, like buy this iPhone, it's selling for, and I decide to buy it. I can't blame Drew if the listing tanks, because I have to look at the data and kind of be like, okay, like this was this is a good idea for me or it's a bad idea it's not his fault he's trying to be helpful and then maybe if he sends me another couple leads and doesn't do well then maybe i just don't buy what he sends me or whatever but number one it's on you my first thing was like oh, i'm blaming her and this or th i thought it was shady i feel like a lot of the stuff that i have on my list is i kind of had this little gut feeling where it's like eh, i don't think that's gonna happen and sure enough something did happen so I feel like that's number one. Um, number two, this was the biggest for me. I basically called the person who recommended them and asked them, hey, she's make, she's saying I owe her 1200 bucks. She didn't give what I wanted. Um, so I didn't get what I wanted. And they said to me, they're like, if this ever happened, I felt super embarrassed because I just assumed that I screwed this up and I didn't know what to do. He's like, you could have called me. It never occurred to me in the moment that I could have called him and asked him. It never thought, like, as crazy as it sounds, like, huh, I wonder if one of the other booksellers have ever had that happen, and how did they get the stuff off the truck? It just never occurred to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there was that, and then he said to me, if you ever get in this situation again, you could refuse the delivery. So if you're doing like wholesale or private label or something and you ordered something that doesn't come like how it's supposed to, you could basically be like, I am not accepting this delivery and send it back. You're going to have a massive problem with the supplier because they are actually paying for the trucking or whatnot. But I had no idea that you could reject a shipment and be like, no, this isn't what I ordered. Take it back. Do whatever. 
Um, so that was a huge learning lesson for me. And I wish I knew that because I would have been like, yeah, take this back. Like, it's not worth, you know, it's not worth eight hours of time unloading this for $1,400 and I'll deal with her later. And I ended up break, like burning a bridge with her anyway. So it would have worked out the same. Um, and then I think the last thing I learned is I think a lot of people kind of get into stuff like this. Everyone wants to buy Gaylords of books or CDs and DVDs because how could you lose? But when you're not experienced and you get something like that, I think if that was my very first load of like DVDs and stuff like that, I'd be like, this business is a sham. I just knew right away from doing it and just knowing metrics and numbers um, that this was someone else's duds. So I was able to go back to her and be like, listen, um, you know, you kind of screwed me on this like went back through text messages that's another probably my last learning lesson is a lot of people say oh like get on the phone and call them well if we did that if i did that i'd have no proof so i literally had text messages of being like i need a truck without a lift gate hey are these these are they call them um uh, i forgot what they call them but basically, there's a, a term. Oh, it's credentialed. So there, it's credentialed material. That means it hasn't been scanned by anyone else. So it's like, oh, these are credentialed. Like, no one else has been through them. It was, like, very clear. I asked her, like, 10 different times. Um, that was an absolute nightmare. But those are kind of my biggest takeaways about that, of, from that uh, kind of disaster. Yeah, I mean, the big, one big one that kind of I've noticed this happening, and, and by the way, it's like cutting out sometimes when I was listening to you, so if my stuff cuts out, just wait for me to come back. <clears throat> but anyways, um, the biggest thing that I uh, that I took from that is what I hear people go through with wholesale all the time. Their friends recommend them something, you know, whatever happens. And these suppliers have different relationships with everybody. Or you might have a different sales rep. Or you might be talking to like a whole different part of this company. So it might just not be going the way... Like you might not get the same experience that everybody else gets. And I've noticed I had a supply. There's a supplier out there that like four people I know and more, honestly, are ordering a bunch of stuff from. And probably a lot of people listen to this are probably ordering stuff from. They're, they give different prices to everybody. They give different delivery dates. They have different like little stories to everybody. And then everybody gets pissed off because, well, I got these, these this price. I, well, that's just like how that stuff goes a lot of the times. Like everyone has a different relationship with all these people. And if you're a big spender, they're probably going to give you better stuff than, you know, the guy that's ordering $2,000 for the stuff over, you know, the guy that's ordered 80K or whatever it is. Yeah, that's a really good point too because he was a massive, the company he was working for is probably one of the, bigger, bigger buyback companies in the space. Um, and for him, if he got these, they would just throw them out. Like it wouldn't yeah. be a big deal because they just don't care. It's not worth their time to fight over it. You know, if they did buy a truckload, you know, the other 44 would be um, probably would like wash out, I guess. And that's the other thing too. Again, like I'm a huge proponent of test buying. This was a test buyer, right? I almost was like, yeah, give me 44. I was going to rent a forklift and do all this stuff. And it was so expensive to rent the forklift. It was just wasn't worth it. So buying these 12 was kind of an eye-opening experience. Oh, this is how they do business. Like, I thank God I don't have 44 of these. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I feel like all the learning lessons and like the lost large amounts of money in this whole business is just logistical things like shipping. Like that's where you yeah. lose all your money is like the shipping stuff. Yeah, that – but one of mine that I've, I've told this before, but back in like 2020, I had these patio heaters I was ordering. And I was selling these like buy them for 90 from Walmart and, buy, and sell them for like 180 on eBay and Amazon. And I would sell like 40, 50 a day. I was like printing money on this stuff. There was one time where – I was like doing this out of my parents' garage, and I filled up the entire garage with three UPS trucks full of patio heaters. So like they brought three different trucks or FedEx trucks. Yeah, they were all pulled in the driveway, unloaded like 150 patio heaters, and then by the time UPS came later that day, I had sold like almost all of them. And then they had to bring multiple trucks to get them back. So I felt like this was just the greatest opportunity of all time. And I was buying all these because they were all around like 30 to 60 pounds. Like they weren't very heavy. Jeez. But – there was one specifically, and I was buying these off a bot. It's called. It was called Eve, and uh, you would just load in the link from Walmart or Home Depot or whatever it was, and it would auto check out like during the night or whenever. 
one night I left it running like a hundred tasks for this patio heater. And I thought it was like all the other ones. I hadn't done my research and honestly it looks smaller. So I thought this is going to be easy. It was $220 selling for like 400. I'm like, this is the best one I can get. So I leave it running. I check out over a hundred of these things one night. I get them all in. Every one of them is broken. Like the box, it was like a hundred and it, almost a hundred pound box, 88 pounds or something destroyed every one of them. But I didn't know what was in the inside. I just heard it rattling and stuff like that. Sold them all on Amazon and got returns on all of them. So I was paying 220 for each, shipping them out for like 60, getting a return back for 50 or 60, whatever it is. And then trying to salvage whatever I could, I would give them away to people, but they'd be broken or like trying to return them back to Home Depot. It was still like, didn't really work. The net loss I probably had on that negated so much of my profit on the other stuff because the other stuff might've been a 30% ROI, but on those I was losing at least $300 per patio heater. So on the other ones, I would have to sell 10 at $30 each profit to make up for each one. I would lose of those. And it was just such a massive amount of money. And this was my first seven months doing this. I had no idea of that stuff even happening, but the biggest learning lesson anybody can take from that is when you're selling high ticket goods, especially heavy high ticket goods, one return will wipe out all your profit. Like if you, if you are making 30% on everything, one big return will just kill you on all the other things. It, it was just like a, a hard learning lesson to take. Cause I just watched the money just dwindle down, but just so many shipping charges here and there and here. Then you put the wrong shipping in and you'd even get extra charges from UPS was just miserable, but that was by far the largest amount of money I've lost that I, that wasn't all in one go. The other ones have just been in one go, but how much overall, money do you think you lost in total on that? Probably like 12 to 15 K I would say. Maybe not. Yeah. Yeah, it had to be around yeah twelve thousand, fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, that but that it was like a slow trickle. So I guess I didn't just lose it all at once. It was just little bits wiped out, and I was making good money on other stuff. So maybe I ended up making it back at the time. My books, I didn't have like a great bookkeeper at the time or anything. So I was just kind of living with my parents, just seeing the cash come in go out. I didn't, I didn't feel the loss like I did on like other stuff. But that was the first big one that you know kind of took me out. I think that's Amazon's almost genius with sellers. You don't really feel these losses until oh, yeah. you look at your bank account or you have to pay a credit card bill and you're like, where is all this money? Like, I, I'm, I have 100K and like, where is all this money? Or where did it all go? And then you open your returns or you start getting stuff back. I mean, yeah, big items are always, I remember I bought these, I think they were ice makers. And I was like, oh, this is great. They were like, I think I was buying them for 50. They were selling for 150. I test bought, I think, eight of them. I was only going to buy three, but I was feeling super optimistic that day. I'm like, no, I'm going to go for eight. Like, get it? Thing number one that gets to the prep center, all of a sudden it's hazmat. It wasn't, I think I texted you. I was like, do you ever ship hazmat? You're like, yeah. no, I don't do hazmat. And that was why. And you were like, what do you do it? You were just like, uh, I was like, what should I do with these? And you're just like, oh, ask your prep center merch to fulfill them. And I did that. And so they, I was not clear with them. They just shipped it in the box. So they didn't put it in another box oh. for one. And then I asked them to do it. And then they put them in Home Depot boxes, which you should not be doing. It has to be a box with no logo. Um, when I and they all got returned, every single one of them. I ended up losing like fifty or sixty bucks on each one. I think I sold one on Facebook Marketplace to someone for like twenty bucks. I was like, these need to go. And yeah, when you're shipping like items like that, I think the shipping on each one was close to thirty dollars to um to get it. So then when the customer doesn't want it, you gotta pay another thirty for them to ship it back to you. <laughs> To me, um, I was telling the customers, I, was, I issued them a refund. The rate, I was like, just keep it and donate it. And I just, I'll send you a refund. And I did. And everyone sent them back. So not only did I refund them all, they all sent them back. Like, I don't know if they thought they didn't send it back. They, and all of them said the packaging was damaged. No, no one was like, oh, it's the fact that they were like, oh, the package is damaged. One person said it was late. Um, so that I probably lost. Kind of like 500 bucks and not that bad 
But if I bought a hundred of them, Jesus, it'd be ridiculous. Yeah, the, I've probably lost so much money like that on those little things. I the the biggest like biggest thing you can take from selling high ticket items. Uh, that's not even that high ticket, but you know yeah. stuff over two fifty, over four hundred bucks. You have to be super adamant about paying attention to those type of things because your losses can just stack up really really big if you're slinging nike socks and shit like that yeah like it doesn't matter because you're making like three dollars profit you're buying them for whatever it's not a big deal but when you start moving up into those high asp items it's just you have to be meticulous about everything or one loss will just take out like loads of your profit i I didn't know that either when i first started doing this type of thing but you know, it's just something you learn throughout. Honestly, I wouldn't even recommend doing it. I wouldn't even sell yeah. stuff over two hundred bucks unless you're going to only sell stuff over two hundred bucks. I know a guy; he's an Arbops, and he sells over a hundred k a month of FBM electronics only, and he sells super high ticket electronics. He does all the gift cards. He knows all these websites. He knows when new electronics drop, so he can sell them all really easy and keep track of everything. Keep track of your returns. Keep track of like when he can return them back to the places. He does that kind of thing. So that he's like really on top of stuff, and I think you have to be if you're doing like high ticket items like that. Yeah, if you're gonna do high ticket too, you you need a liquidation like plan. Like mm-hmm. when I was buying high ticket stuff, one of the things I always looked at was like eBay. Like, what are the comps on this? If it gets returned, to see how far away that I might be, for how much money I could lose, or if the price went down. Like sometimes the price of something on Amazon, let's just call it two hundred new on ebay it's 125 and your buy cost is 100 i'm like yeah that's a big no-go for me because you know whatever gets returned i was also buying the another higher end item and it was selling for 175 i was paying i don't know 80 90 bucks for each one of these it's making like 30 bucks a piece on them and the first 10 no problem they go through and then all of a sudden i upped the order to 20 and people start returning them and saying they're not the same thing as the listing. And I don't, I don't catch it until I actually place the 20 and I'm like, Oh, this is great. Like 10 sell. I'm like, let me place an order for 30. And then literally a week I, I got so lucky. So this is a good lesson too. So I did this one place. Um, I was like, shit, all these are getting returned. I need to stop because each thing is costing me like 80 bucks. I'm still getting returns. Two just came yesterday. I'm like, I hate these things. Um, and basically, when I ordered them, I was like, I want 30. And they're like, you have to wait. It's back ordered. Like, we have to make an order with the supplier. And then someone literally returned five in the same day. And I actually, like, made up a BS excuse. And was like, hey. Basically, it was like, oh, what I'm doing with these is canceled. I need to cancel this order. If you didn't order them yet, can you cancel it? And they're like, yeah, we could cancel it. Because they didn't order from the supplier yet. So it saved me like three grand. <laughs> like That would have been terrible. Because it was like a three grand buy cost. So I would have had to like liquidate all that. And that's another thing. It was going to the prep center. So it's not like it even goes to your house. And you're like, oh, I'll just return it. Or I'll sell it else. It just adds like an extra layer of complexity. Well, what's the most you've ever lost at one time? Probably oh, yeah. because I've lost I've lost over fifteen grand four separate times I think four separate times <laughs> yeah that was one or over ten grand that was one time the next time and this one hit the hardest and this really it, it got me pretty down because of how it, this whole situation was I've never heard this ever happening to somebody so where I'm from I guess so I had moved out to somewhere else and got a pretty big name for myself because I was shipping so much out. I mean, I was doing like a hundred, 150 K a month, all FB and out, FBA and out of my place. And I, they probably hadn't seen that before. I know that because the, F, the FedEx guy came and said, you're our biggest customer. And I'm like, what about the businesses? And he was like, no, you, like, you are free stuff. Yeah. I was, he, so well, they were really nice to me. So until this, so I make the biggest shipment I've ever made for UPS right before Christmas. This is 2021. And I had, like uh, 50 of these graphics card things. These were like 400 bucks a piece sell costs. I paid so much. I remember buying these in a bar one night for like 160 a piece. They sold for 400. I'm like, this is the biggest hit ever. Like I'm going to make five, six grand off this one purchase. All those are in there. All these toys that I'd like held for probably over a year. Tons. The one that hurt me the worst, all those free Lego sets that you would get with when oh, you were yeah. 
And I would, I stored all those and they had all went up to like a hundred dollars a piece, 80 bucks a piece. Cause they were so old at that point, like over a year and a half. I sent all these out for Christmas. Someone in UPS picks up the shipment and steals it. Like, so I, I lay the shipment out of my apartment. I go to lunch or something. I come back and the shipment's gone. So I'm like, okay, they picked it up. Somebody else comes, a UPS worker at six o'clock. And he's like, where's your pickup today? I usually you have a bunch of stuff. And I was like, you guys already picked it up. And they delivered something as they picked it up. Like there was a UPS package. So I was like, I think somebody else did. And they're like, oh, that's weird. So I didn't think anything of it. And then a week goes by, two weeks go by, and none of the shipments had even moved like to go to FBA. So I asked the UPS guy that usually comes, you know, what happened? Like who, what could have possibly happened here? He was like, I don't know. I would call UPS, like the local one. You can't even get UPS on the phone. So if you lose something like that, best of luck. You, I went down it's to the word. center. It, yeah, it's a, it's a lost cause. You might as well just forget about it. So I walked down to the center of like UPS <laughs> where I'm from. I walk in. I was like, hey, you guys lost. You, someone stole 16, 15 grand, whatever it was. And this is the buy cost. of sell cost, this was like over 30 grand of like shit for Christmas. The guy is like, well, my guy's not here. My manager's not here. I was like, I'm going to sit here until he gets here. Did you hear what I just said? 15 grand. Like, what do you make? You know, I was like being really mean to this guy because – I'd never lost so much money at one point just right in front of me. And I knew I got robbed. So that like pissed me off even more. Like too, a lot of the time it's like you didn't lose 15 grand. You did, but you're thinking about how much you could have made on it. And that just, yeah. that's like the knife twist. You're just, oh, and I, ah. and dude, when you get, I don't know if you've ever been robbed or whatever before. I've been like robbed twice where I caught the person. Same at this one apartment complex. It just was terrible. But when you get that, when you get robbed or somebody steals a bunch of stuff for you, it really feels weird. Like it's a really odd feeling because to watch someone and see the person, you know, that's like stole from you or whatever. But anyways, uh, I'll ask this guy, I call his manager. I'm like, hey, man, like who delivered on this day? Because I know it's not this one guy because he's always talking to me. It must be somebody else. He's like, okay, I'm going to call that guy. I'll get back to you. Well, there's no number. It was like a 1-800 number. So I couldn't get back to him. So I have to just, I'm just, all my trust is in this dude, John. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah, have your number, your badge. Yeah. No, we'll call you back. Like, yeah. Uh, his, okay. his name is John too, ironically. <laughs> but So he calls me back a week later and he said, hey man, I can't get this guy on the phone right now. But um, so I guess he's maybe sick. He's taken off this week. I'll call him again next week. He calls me again a week or two later and he says, hey, I have bad news. That guy put in his two weeks notice like the day after. I was like, so he definitely stole my stuff, right? <laughs> like, obviously this happened. He was like, yeah, but there's nothing we can really do about this. I can't give you his name or whatever. I'm like so angry at this point because I'm like this clarified that this happened. This guy must have heard that I was this big shipper in the area. So he plans a day right before Christmas, my biggest package, and probably takes it all and drops it off somewhere and then drops his thing off and said, you know, whatever, and then quit. And who knows who, what other stuff he stole that day. It was like midst of Christmas. So I follow a police report, but obviously the police don't do anything like that. You know, they, I don't know if, if anybody has it. What? Yeah. The police just, well, if you get, if you go to the police by anything, they're not going to help you by the way. So if something goes wrong with your life, don't go to the police. They're not going to help. They have better stuff to worry about, which is whatever. So i say, Hey, I lost 15 grand. I submit all these reports, all this stuff. They called, they said, we can't get in contact with UPS. So we went down there and they won't even talk to us. This guy won't. They, they're they saying he's not here. This is all like odd or whatever. Never hear back from the police report again. I try to call back and say, hey, where, what's my number? They're like, oh, we had to switch the officer on your case. I'm like, oh, so you just gave up on it. So I just lost this massive thing that would have probably doubled my Christmas sales at the time. And I lost the 15K. <laughs> it was the most brutal Two weeks ever because I stopped trusting anybody. I was like, everybody's out to get me, and I lost all this money. It was just terrible, all in one go. And there's nothing I could do about it. Like, it wasn't really the learning lesson from that is I don't know. Pay attention to your stuff. Don't don't schedule pickups and just let them go. But yeah, it, it was awful. So much money lost at one time. Yeah, I, I think that's a big lesson too. Like when I used to ship out a ton of books, and so you only send fifty pounds at a time. So like all these Home Depot boxes add up. But, like, when the guy came, he was a great, like, UPS driver. Like, you always want to make sure they scan every box. Like, that there's, like, a record of a scan because that scan starts, like, the process of, like, hey, it was picked up. It's in the system or whatever. Um, that is crazy, though. <laughs> yeah, that that's the worst one. Like, 
the worst feeling one because I saw it happen. I felt the losses because my December sales just got cut in half because that was the biggest shipment. And yeah, it, it was bad. That, then I, after that, I got a prep center. I was like, okay, I, at least from this point on, it's not going to be my fault if somebody steals a bunch of my shit. And, you know, luckily so far, I haven't had that big of losses What what from that situation. But something, I'll just parlay into the next story because <laughs> it's a similar type of thing. I made this deal with somebody off Twitter. They never do this kind of thing. I'm very against this now. <laughs> True, a like Twitter deal. Come on, man. Yeah, well, it wasn't. It wasn't exactly a um, like one of these shady deals that people make. It was more so they knew this loop on this website and they really? didn't want to give up the loop, but they would order for me. So it was my name on everything. It was like oh, okay. it was just their credit card that was doing it. It was just I paid them money for. Everything was my name except for the credit card. And they ran this loop and it was just a, a shoe. And I got probably spent 18 grand. I think I wired them like $18,000 or something. And the potential on this one was like 40K. Well, and it was like 200 and some pairs of shoes. I get the shipment, it gets sent out, and every single shoe gets lost at one of those like fly. Oh, ID4. One of, that, <laughs> oh one of those FC. Yeah, it was ID4. That's exactly where it got lost. So then I was in another panic because this was this was last year, uh, right before Christmas. It was probably in October or so, September, October. And uh, I submit these receipts. They're not going because I can't get in contact with the person I made the deal with on Twitter anymore because they're going through this like depressive episode to where they're tweeting stuff about like how bad their life is. And I feel bad because I'm like, <laughs> I need these invoices, but I don't want to you know pressure you into you know whatever it is. And they were, it was like dark. Like I was going through this Twitter and I'm like, they're not even, what is going on? Do I console this person? I need my 20 grand, but I also don't want this person to, you know, blame me for whatever happens here. So I'm like kind of blowing them up, but also trying to console them, whatever it is. It was like a crazy situation. That's why I don't do any kind of deals like that anymore. But eventually, even without the PDFs, like they never even uh, took the invoices for whatever it was all the shoes just got recovered and I ended up selling the shoes for less money than I thought I would, but it was in November or something. I ended up having a really good month because of it, but I was out all the cash for a while because the stuff was just completely lost. And it was like a pretty big hit at the time. Jeez. Is that, wow. You weren't <laughs> able to figure out their loop. Uh, I did, but it, I figured it out after it was like over, it was like a really popular one. Yeah. Well, I, I like to say it, it was uh, ASOS. It was like a really big ASOS loop. Is what you had, and then this is going to be some sauce if this ever comes back. But this, you had to switch your country and you could order from something else. I, I think it's like Clip now, but that was a big like sneaker shoe seller loop. Oh, for a while. I feel like I heard someone talk about it wasn't anywhere online, but yeah, you, know, you could do it, do it. Yeah, that that was a bad one though. I'd say that those are two of my those are, I guess those are my three biggest ones. The other only other one was Top Shot twenty twenty, which is like a card thing. And I this was just the first time I'd ever had any money. I'd had like twenty five grand in my bank account, and I'd never even had over two grand before. So I'm like, I'm gonna invest in these baseball cards, and they're gonna make me super rich. Yeah, that whole market crashed in like two days, and I lost. I don't even know how much money I lost there. Probably the most out of all that stuff because I was buying baseball cards for three hundred, five hundred bucks a piece. And hoping oh, to sell for a thousand, yeah. But spending three hundred, five hundred bucks, hoping to double my money. All those cards are worth sub ten dollars now. I was going through them the other night; they're worth like literally nothing. Because I got wiped like ninety five percent on these baseball cards. I still have all of them too. So I'm just hoping one day, twenty years, thirty years from now, maybe they'll be worth something. Maybe I can sell them for something at that point. But whatever. It's funny you say. Oh, it's not funny, but. <laughs> Uh, like thinking about some of this stuff, I, like you talk about Top Shot, I remember having such FOMO for not one understanding the market, two understand what was going on with NFTs. It's like, oh, you're this is the future. I don't know anything about NFTs or like the V friends. And I was like, oh man, like Gary Vee being like, if you know anything, like this is the thing of the future, and it probably is eventually. But I remember just having such like massive FOMO, and then that the GameStop stuff like everyone was like every amazon seller was now like uh what were they even trading it on the GameStop? you know what i'm talking about it was like no. uh crap i can't remember but basically it was like one of those like forex sites or something it wasn't forex but it was like another one and basically 
they basically just like stop. Oh, yeah, yeah, Robin Hood. On Robin Hood. Yeah, Robin yeah. Hood. Robin's like, yeah, no more orders. Or like, I forgot what, how it swayed. And like, everyone just lost so much money. And I was like, oh man, I wish I wish I was more savvy and all this other stuff. And then it just kind of turned out that none of that stuff worked out. But like, you get such FOMO of like, oh man, Drew has, you know, 50 boxes on his driveway. He's so cool. I didn't know they got stolen. You know what I mean? Like, you just, it's like crazy. Well, well, the big thing with all those investment type of things, because people always ask me that of uh, like what I should do here. What should I invest in here? Dude, if you don't have a hundred grand, don't even worry about that stuff. You, you will not. I saw uh, Martin Shkreli, the guy that overcharged for um, yeah. insulin or whatever. He, he said, uh, this guy calls him. This was like one of the best clips I've ever seen. This was like a month ago. It was a he said, million. Uh, he, I think he was on there. Yeah, yeah, I think he was too. And, uh, but he was on a lot, he does, he used to do live streams like 10 years ago. And this guy said, Hey, I'm 24 years old. I have a lot of money. What do you think's the best investment? And he said, you're 24 years old. You don't have a lot of money. And the guy's like, well, how do you know that? And he goes, okay, well then how much money do you have? And the guy's like, I have about a hundred and some grand, 120 grand or whatever. And he's like, yeah, that's not a lot of money, dude. And he was like, <laughs> I was like, I I, you're 24. You need to work on getting a million dollars or getting $2 million. And then you can start investing because there's a way better chance that you take that 120 or take that 200 and lose it all trying to get there rather than, you know, whatever you think you're going to do. Yeah, and I was getting 120 into like a million that it would be to try to invest or like hit the market, yeah. right? Yeah, he said pay for skills, pay for mentors, whatever it is. You need to grow your income to where you can make a million dollars and then invest it instead of trying to invest your way to a million. And that's – I've all, I was always trying to do that and shortcut my way to making a bunch of money at the beginning. But now I don't do any kind of investments. Like I'll throw some stuff in the stock market here and there, but not much. I'm just like I'll, if I buy something, I'd rather invest into a $10,000 coaching program or like a $20,000 mastermind thing because I'm going to learn more there that's going to make me more money than just – what eight percent a year or whatever it is and then once inflation hits it's just like negative so yeah it, i'm not a big investment person anymore and all those things like you said you get fomo and you get wiped out so yeah you that's never me. see the wipe out like you see it in the news but it's never the people on it they just delete their instagram account or whatever and you just never hear from them ever again yeah it's like a co very common thing people invest all in this big thing and then once you get wiped out it's very easy to see that stuff where Amazon, we were talking about how it's like, you don't really see what's going on when you're making big investments in that stuff with liquid cash, trying to get liquid cash back. You see when that goes down, you invest 10 K and it goes to zero. There it goes. That whole account's just bombed and you're gone. I would say if you're going to do any investment type stuff, if people are thinking, you know, what about this opportunity or this, if you hear it from someone who's already rich, and they have an inside source. That's the only time I would do anything like that, which that's even borderline illegal, I guess, depending on their source. But that's the only way you can make it work. Because if you see it on Twitter, dude, it's already way too late. Like if you, all yeah. those opportunities that you're seeing people talk about, if they're putting it on the internet, it's too late for it. Because if not, they'd be juicing it right now. Or they're trying to pump it up and they're going to dump it on you. <clears throat> so I got it. Okay, so I'll lead into one of mine then. So we, we kind of already trashed this company in another video. <laughs> or do is live, so we're not going to mention the name of the company, but whatever. Um, so basically, I think this like really is a rare case where so basically there's a service. Don't ask for a link. Don't ask for anything because we're not promoting it. Um, that basically will handle all your Amazon returns and look kind of list them on eBay and do all this other stuff. They charge a, a ridiculous fee now. They basically like quadruple their fee. Um, but at the time it seemed like a great idea. Basically, you know, I don't have to deal with the returns anymore. They're going to go through this stuff. You know, it was almost like pitched as they used to be sellers. So they obviously know like the pain of this and do, running an eBay store sucks unless that's what you do full time. It's just annoying to list. Like It's just, it can be worth your time, but it almost has to be in a massive, like, kind of volume. So they were going to do all this. They're going to manage it. They're going to ship it out. All this stuff. And for me, I used to run, you know, I think at the height, I did 100K on eBay, just selling used books in a single year. So I was like, oh, if they know what they're doing, they're going to, like, basically sell on eBay how I used to sell on eBay. Well, it turns out it was none of that. I remember getting the first bill from them and it was, I want to say it was like 400 bucks. I was like, 
where the hell, what do you mean $400? And it was just like, well, you know, um, about, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 returns came. Well, it's $3 to list. I thought they would get, I was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to liquidate stuff. I'm like, I have 10 of these. No, they're just going to create one listing and list 10. No, it was an individual. And you could blame myself because I didn't ask that question. I just assumed that they would get like one sweatshirt and that would count as one listing. So that yeah. was number one. Number two, they took the shittiest pictures. Like, I don't, it's like they're using like a razor flip phone. <laughs> like, I don't even know if an iPhone takes that bad of a picture. And it's like, it's like the sweatshirt on a hanger you get free from a dry cleaner and the sweat and the sweatshirt's like a wrinkled mess like it, it was just like are you guys serious right now and so you were paying for that and then there were storage fees and then it wasn't until Soros came on a live that i did with michaela he's like no dude that's all wrong like their incentive is to list it on ebay she's like oh we'll send it back to amazon for you like you could decide it was just something i didn't think through so basically, like, if I was getting shit like this, and this maybe, I don't know, it just costs $10 or something. If I can't sell it on Amazon, it sounds crazy. The best move is probably to dispose of it. Just yeah. call it a day. Not send it to some other person who's going to list it on eBay and charge me $3 to create a listing. And then I'm going to lose money. That was the other big thing that, oh my god, pissed me off so much, was they would basically had no common sense like if one of these got sent back it wasn't like hey we saw the ebay comps for this is like five dollars do you want us to list it they're like nope we're gonna charge you four dollars to list this free shipping i i don't i probably lost four or five grand just with them just yeah. like stupid stuff like this i tried to i canceled the account and they're like oh what inventory do you want back i told them they're like all right yeah we'll get right on it they charged me for another month. I'm like, all right. It was two days past. So I told them to cancel. And it was like the thing renewed or I don't know. Vice, basically, it was two days. And then I told them to cancel. And they're like, well, we'll charge him another month. So they sent an email to me that said, hey, we're working on, you know, getting you your stuff. Um, we'll We'll be back in touch. Haven't heard from them. And uh, in my head, I'm just like, maybe they should just keep all this stuff. And just because they're going to charge, they're probably going to charge me again. Be like, oh, we're processing your stuff. So you're still subscribed. And then I'll probably get the stuff. And I'll be like, why did I even get this sent back? I should have just wrote it all off. Yeah, man, I feel so bad because I recommended like 10 people that company. And every person has the same thing. Like they lost money on it. And it's because I saw it on, um, Who's the guy? It's on Chris Grant's podcast. I think, um, yeah. I was like, this is genius. I can't wait to sign up for this. Yeah, horrible service. Uh, really, the the best way to We're make not blaming a, Chris because Chris is no, off, no, no. at all. Yeah, but but it was on his thing and they, they were like, I don't know. You, I don't know what to I say about the flip. Point. That was my point is like, why isn't everyone doing this? Like, yeah. it just seemed like, it, like when you told me, I was like, holy, like, yeah, like, I'm going to do this. And, like, I guess it was such, I think one of the biggest takeaways for me, actually, you wrote, uh, basically, kind of, you have to almost not get emotion. It's so exciting. I'm never going to have to deal with returns again. But a lot didn't occur to me. Like, oh, is this stuff worth sending to them? One of the the shittiest parts about Amazon's returns is like, you have to set up that they're sending them to you. So it's not like, Hey, um, we're returning this. Someone's returning this. Do you want it shipped to you? Do you want it shipped to this other place? Amazon just sends it off like as quickly as humanly possible. And we'll send like, I'll get like four or five boxes a day of just return random stuff. I think you could set it up till they do it once, but I don't feel like, getting a pallet here. like i just don't i'd rather just get it and kind of decide what to do with it um so that's like one big problem i think the idea is good in theory maybe you're selling higher end stuff but i think they basically just failed because the prices they want now make no sense whatsoever so i think they're just really trying to kick people out um and they don't want to do it anymore 
Yeah, I mean, the biggest, here's a great business idea for anybody. If you want to start a business to where it muddies the water even more with your books and your profitability, and people really can't see exactly what's going on, something like that, you can make a huge bag because Amazon sellers don't pay close attention to that stuff, and you just charge them 500 bucks here, 600 bucks here. That's what it felt like was there was zero quality, which every service I pay for online, I feel like there's like zero quality almost, but yeah. the quality control just wasn't there at all. And it just seemed like a huge money grab that that was the issue. Like they weren't, weren't communicative. Like this stuff you said, if something was five bucks to send it in and knowing this cost, like knowing the client is losing money, like bad, yeah. like you're not going to retain, retain your clients like that. Their churn rate has to be through the roof. Like the only people that would stay with that company are just idiots or people that just aren't aware in the circle because you're just constantly losing money. I lost a ton off of it too. I even tried to do a bunch of auctions when they were about to liquidate my stuff. And I was getting 10% of my buy costs on the option. Like it, what was the point of that? You know, it just more shipping fees. I probably ended up losing at the end. So yeah, you would sell something for $20 that you paid 20 for plus another, who knows, eight to $10 to ship it. You would have been better throwing it in the garbage. The, the only way to deal with your returns optimally is for you to do everything yourself and do it in house. I mean, there's probably companies yeah, that do it somewhat, that. but I haven't saw any. And I know that when you sell it on Facebook yeah, Marketplace I mean, and you sell it locally, you can get way more money for it. And you don't have to pay a bunch of fees. You don't have to worry about returns. Because when you get something back, the worst part about eBay is you sell on eBay. What if they return it again? I just sold a $150 item on eBay. It was broken because the that company didn't inspect it correctly or whatever. So I was like, just keep it. Here's the money. Just keep this, yeah, whatever it is. Yeah. You can throw it away. You can do whatever you want with it. Because if you ship it back to me, what am I going to do with it? I'll throw it away. So whatever. It's just, it's just, you just get into a thing where you're just losing a ton of money. And I don't know. I haven't heard anybody with a good experience. And I just, all those companies just super shady. Well, that's the other thing too. If I had to do this business over, I would say, and this is the, this is probably thinking back. This was probably a, a huge red flag. It kind of makes sense, but it also doesn't make sense is they, they sell on your eBay account. I yeah. have 800 positive feedbacks and doing it. I got with them. I think there was like two negative feedbacks and you can't remove feedback on eBay. eBay's response is like, you got to take it up with the customer. So basically you got to make friends with the customer and ask them to remove it. This person was pissed. So I didn't even bother. I don't sell. I don't, I was like, I don't give a shit. Like I have 800 plus reviews. Like this one is not going to hurt me. But that just more incentive for them. Like they don't care because it was there. So how I would do it, I would put everything on my eBay store and just yeah. have unique SKUs and then kind of just be like, I guess the sucky part for the customer would be like, it would be delayed. So I do what Amazon does like, oh, I'm going to hold the case returns or whatever. And then I guess it's probably more work accounting on the back end of like who, what's what. I'm sure now there's like plenty of software like you could, I don't know, and probably t you could probably pay someone to build you a custom like Airtable or something to kind of figure it out. But I think that would be like the model and kind of do a 50-50 split on that because then they're super incentivized to make a good listing because if they sell for higher money, they get more money. I think they just were really looking for a bag. Anything yeah. that you pay per I mean, a prep center is a little different because that's just a different model. And I think that was kind of my point too. Why, like not, why isn't everyone not talking about this? One and two, it's like, why did you gatekeep this? There's no benefit for me yeah. not telling you, right? Because yeah. it doesn't matter because it's, it's a benefit for both of us. It's not like we're sharing ASINs or, you know, my prep center is like kind of small and I know Drew's a bigger seller. And then, you know, my prep center starts working with him, his shipments over my, it just becomes like murky. Um, so that was kind of like a big flag and kind of one of the reasons why I do not rec like recommending services. Cause I think like back to like kind of the Gaylord situation with the CDs and DVDs, like, I don't care what anyone says. Everyone's treated differently. Like this is mm -hmm. a fact of life. It does like you could say, "Oh, yeah, everyone's equal." Like that's not true at all. It goes for customers. I think even for Amazon sellers, like there's some Amazon sellers who get suspended for doing nothing, in hypothetical, um, and some people who have a bazillion counterfeit claims and all this other stuff. 
and they don't get suspended or don't have any issues. So I just think it's one of those things where it's one of those things. Everyone gets treated differently, so you just got to look at it like that. Yeah, that's tough. So, Rob, I'm never going to recommend a service to anybody again because I'm the one that started all that, and I just, like, screwed so many people over. But, like, I, I have, like, well, you, I was just, you know, oh, this looks amazing. I'm going to do it. How is, I'm the first person because I was one of the first 10 viewers on this podcast. It popped up. I'm like, I, I'm going to get it on this early, which is terrible. Uh, the only thing in the future I'm going to recommend to people is somebody's program. Like or somebody's mm-hmm. like course, if I if I pay a lot of money for a specific mentorship or whatever it is, and then it's really good, I'd recommend that. Like there's something I yeah. paid for last year that was really good, and I've put like a bunch of people onto that because I'm like, I know that if you apply this knowledge, it works. So it's different than them doing something for you, like a done for you type of service. I, it's hard for me to recommend any of that because I just know so much can go wrong. But people are always asking me for recommendations, and I'm like, I I just recommend you do your own research. A lot of other people do that to me too. Like, oh, now that you don't sell books, like can I have your book source or your Gaylord source or whatever? Like one, I think that just, that you're not going to make it. If you're asking for a source for books, you're just not going to make it. Like if you can't find one, like, I'm sorry. Like you're just not going to make it. Number two, like I feel like a lot of people don't realize it's my reputation on the line. If I say, hey, Drew, like go buy these books for my supplier. Like I haven't worked with the guy in a year. Like, I don't know, does he, did he, like, screw some people over in the, the meantime? Or maybe Drew doesn't know what the hell he's doing, and he's going to be like, John, you're an idiot. Yeah. It's like, no, dude, like, I don't think you know what you're doing. As yeah. like, you have equipment, you have, like, no. Well, yeah, of course it didn't work out for you. Like, you don't have a forklift. You don't have a place to process them. Like, like what do you think? Like, I have an eBay account. I have all these dud buyers in place. Like, that's why it works for me. If you don't have any of that, then you're screwed. Or... Drew acts like an asshole to the supplier, and the supplier's like, "What's wrong with you? This guy is such a pain in the ass. Like, why did you send him to me?" And then he's gonna be mad at me. So yeah. I feel like pe- people don't understand that. Yeah, that's a huge one too. I feel really bad because somebody recommended me a prep center a few months ago, and I slowed down on my buying a ton in the last few months because of just all those other reasons I've told you about. And I'm like, oh. I feel bad now because this guy's probably like, you're getting a whale of a client to come in and I'm just like not even sending anything. And now both prep sitters are like, dude, where one's I use, where's your stuff at? Who are you sending it to? I'm like, nobody. I'm just not buying anything to send you guys. But I feel bad because you guys both had me making you a bunch of money and now it's just like I don't provide any yeah. income. But, you know, I feel it's bad. It's really for hard to recommend something that like when you rely on someone to do something, whether that's buying to send a prep or like things just change like maybe your prep center's best employee like gets fired or decides to leave and that leaves a huge hole and that person just impossible to handle that um situation so yeah that was like a big one Uh, on the the return stuff the big i mean the biggest loss technically is all the returns i have sitting in a storage unit i mean that if you don't get on top of that stuff early, which I talk about it all the time, but I just don't even do it. It's just hard to put it into action, which I have a plan now and I'm hoping this works out. I'm about to hire a friend for him to sell everything for me and he's highly incentivized. So his salary is going to be like super small base plus a very large commission on all these sales. So it's like you're incentivized to put them on Facebook or put them wherever and then just give me the cash. I trust the guy. I might have a story about that in six months, but I got screwed there too. Make but... sure we do this episode, Drew. Someone <laughs> stole thirty grand from my storage yeah. unit. He's I mean, super... worked at my storage unit to ship something from eBay, and nothing was in it. It's like, what it could... happened? It could happen, but I'm open. I, I just want to get the money back, and then I have some plans of what I'm going to do with the money because it's all just sitting there, and it's expensive stuff. I just went there and organized it yesterday, and I saw a bunch of these uh, certain things that I had last year, and they've went up in value like five x. So I, I've got ten grand worth of stuff in like three boxes, and it was I paid originally probably two thousand dollars for it. So I might even profit off this whole storage unit because a lot of the stuff we buy, if you let it sit over time, it just gains in value, especially because a lot of it's toys and a lot of it's like rare sure. stuff. So it's not just you know junk; it's very good new items. So I'm hoping that works out. Yeah, I mean, hopefully. I mean, you are you going to set it back to Amazon some of it, or mostly has to be liquidated elsewhere? I'll be, if it's yeah, if it's new, I'll FBM it. If it's something that sells well, like some of the stuff I've already been doing it. Yeah. <clears throat> so I guess one of my other ones was basically Tiger Lily Prep Center. That was an absolute disaster. 
that this is a great example of something everyone was talking about and recommending um and just kind of dropping the ball so basically tiger lily held probably close to 20 grand of my inventory hostage i couldn't i learned so much from this and i think this will be super helpful because i don't think i've ever heard anyone talk about this i have a youtube one or two YouTube videos about it, but the solution I never even thought of, and I'm kind of going to get into it, but basically everything's going great. I have a book business. I'm starting to dabble in OA, go to a conference. Someone's like, oh yeah, I use Tiger Lily. Like they're amazing. And uh, I don't know. It's a little different if you're a total stranger. So if Drew just like pops up my DM and asks for a prep center, I'd be like, I don't know you. But if he asked me today, I'd be like, yeah, here's who I use. And it's always kind of like that. Like I built up an audience. So like I could kind of ask for favors or ask for advice and it's just different. Um, and that's kind of how this Tiger Lily prep thing was. And this is everyone, I would say like in the room, like 20 people were using them. And, you know, I felt like, so basically what happens, everything's going great. Then all of a sudden my stuff's not getting checked in. You know, I'm looking at the Google doc, nothing's happening. You know, I'm checking my tracking numbers, stuff's getting delivered there. They used to be super responsive, and I don't hear anything from them. And I'm starting to, like, freak out, because 20K for me, it's just a lot of money in general. I mean, let's yeah. be honest. Like, I was just getting OA started. Like, luckily, I had a book business that was, you know, making all the money, and OA was just kind of getting started. And I, I just remember a pit in my stomach being like, damn, like, there's nothing I could do about this. Because it's not like I could drive down the street and be like, hey, where's the stuff? Or all this other stuff. Um, so, basically what happened was, I didn't hear from him. So, then I knew other people, so I would text Drew. He wasn't using them. I was like, hey, does your stuff, like, went out yet? Like, what's the deal? And he's like, nah. I was like, I didn't really think much about it. I'm like, I'll just kind of give it a week or whatever. And then it got bad when I started getting DMs. Be like, hey, have they shipped any of your stuff out? I was getting like five a day. I'm like, oh man, like this is a huge problem. So I was just like, I can't get a hold of them, like by text or like it was the dumbest thing I've ever done, most likely. Like it was just basically just sent like twenty thousand dollars worth of inventory. I didn't even have their phone number. I literally emailed them and was just like, Hey, you're taking new clients? They're like, Yep. They're like, here's a Google Doc. Okay, great. Here's the address. I'm like, cool. I just started sending them stuff. And it was great for the first four weeks or six weeks or whatever. I never thought about it. And then when someone's like, oh, why don't you try to call them? I'm like, uh, yeah, that's a great idea. And there was no phone number on their website at the time. And I was like, crap. <laughs> like, this is a problem. And then somehow I got the phone number because... I think it was in some email. So, and it turned out it was their cell phone number. So here are the big takeaways from this for sure. Number one, you got to like community is really important. So I remember posting, it was in Chris Grant's Facebook group. And I told the whole story, what happened. And someone gave, and I was like, I don't know what to do. Well, first things first, the biggest lesson, I was like so pissed about this. I just like couldn't think or like think straight. I just remember listening to a podcast and they were like, whenever you're in a tough situation, imagine the worst happened. So for me, I was like, I'm out 20 grand. Like, what does that mean? Well, it sucks. Like I was fortunate to be in a situation where it would suck. Like I have another business that's making money that could kind of absorb that loss. Like even though it's a big loss, um, it's still a loss. And so once I came to grips, like, well, that's the worst that could happen. I was like, okay, let's make a game plan now. Like, I don't think that's going to happen. So, like, knowing that in my head, I'm like, okay, like, let's try to, like, it became let's try to get as much as that money back as possible. And if it's all gone, it's all gone. And, like, I'll learn from this. So someone in the group was like, like you were saying, oh, call the cops. Like, they're not going to do anything. So I was like, no, no, no. You call the cops and say you want to do a wellness check. So a wellness check is basically when you call someone, I like looked into all this. So basically it's like, I could do a wellness check on you. So I could be like, Hey, me and Drew, we text every day. We do this podcast. Drew didn't show up today. I haven't heard from Drew. 
like, can you just go over there and like make sure he's still alive? Kind mm-hmm. of thing. So that's exactly what I did. And these are these people are Montana. So I remember Googling like Montana police. Like you're not local, you don't know like who to call or whatever. Yeah. Um and like the first like number I call goes to a voicemail. Like no one answers the phone at the police station. And it's like, please leave a voicemail. I think I have the recording somewhere on my f- computer. And then it just goes like, oh, mailbox is full. I'm like, oh, crap. Like, this is, like, how could the police station have, like, a full mailbox? Or, like, no one pick up the phone. And then it turned out, like, there was another police station. And so one thing, too, here is, like, you got to get creative. So I texted the person, and they weren't texting me back. And I was like, listen, if you don't get back to me, I'm calling the police to, like, do a wellness check or whatever. So I, like, kept my threat. So I said I'm doing it. And she didn't write me back, so I called the cops. And that was the first text I got back. Like, oh, the police just came here. Like, don't worry. All your stuff's safe. Like, I lost my phone. And di- no one loses their phone. Like, if you lose your phone, you go get a new one, like, two hours ago. Like, you- you're not going without a phone. And it never dies. Like, I'm- it just doesn't happen today. Like, it just doesn't. Like, I'm sorry. Um, she's like, oh, I'm going to get your stuff out today or whatever. Um, I'm like, okay, great. Like, this was, like, the start of something. So then, of course, like, the stuff never gets out. Nothing is happening. And I'm just like, listen, if you don't get the stuff out, I'm going to get a lawyer. Like, you're not giving me any choice. Whatever. So, sure enough, the ship is not created on Amazon. So you can kind of see this stuff. Like, a big th- a big hack, if you share a Google Doc, you could look at the edit history and see, like, what's going on. And if not, there's no activity... Like, it even tracks that they put, like, a period or, like, a space. So, I knew she didn't even go in there. So, my girlfriend is actually a lawyer. So, I was like, all right, fine, here we go. So, she left her a message and was like, listen, like, you know, John hired me as his attorney. You have, I forgot what it was. It's, like, 20 grand worth of stuff. Like, this is the criminal code, like, for my, like, and, like, sure enough, she's like, Oh, I'm so, she actually called her and was like, oh, you know, uh, I showed some sob story about something or whatever. Um, but yeah, so it was kind of, that was like a big, like, you have to like make good on your threats. If Like, you don't want to just be like, oh, I'm going to call the cops. And then the person's like, yeah, right. And then you don't, then you lose all leverage and credibility in the situation. So you really got to do that kind of stuff. And like, so one, like ask the community for help. Like, two, I feel like, even me, I'm guilty of it. You almost don't see it's these, like, micro moments. It's, like, sometimes when we're when buying inventory, like, if I'm spending, like, 50, 60 grand a month, it almost doesn't feel like that because it's on a credit card. It's not like I'm actually, like, putting out money into someone's hand. It's just kind of like a credit, and then it gets paid. But, like, if I think about it this year, I probably sell my prep center close to, like, 300 grand worth of stuff. Mm -hmm. right it's over 12 months so it doesn't seem like that but like for bigger sellers like you would you send probably like half a million dollars yeah 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 700 grand where the stuff so when you're like oh man you're sending seven hundred thousand dollars of stuff to like some random stranger you've never met right it's like absolutely crazy and this also like busted open a lot of stuff because someone in the group actually lived in Montana and actually drove down to the address. I was like, I don't see a prep center. And it turned out they were doing it out of like a trailer. And there were just Kohl's boxes all in this like wide open field. And there was like a flood there like that week. And I was like, oh my God. And then what was sent out, like half, like Amazon lost half the stuff. I'm sure she didn't put half the stuff in the box. Yeah. But, man, that was, like, so I probably ended up losing, I don't know, probably about six grand all said and done. And probably even more. It was, like, a two- or three-week process just to, like, get the stuff back, track them down, get an address. And it just, like, the next prep center I used, it was, like, I need pictures of the facility. Like, I want a Zoom call. Like, (laughs) who are you? Like, all this stuff, and it sounded so ridiculous. But then when you think about it, like, if you're going to send someone $250,000, like, wouldn't you want to ask them some questions, maybe, like, see them on a Zoom, stuff like that? So that was a huge, 
learning lesson for me and i was like man like i never want to be in this situation again yeah i, I find it hilarious to think about just a big field with a bunch of amazon boxes like all over it just like underwater and these people they probably started out of their trailer like two clients and then it just picked up and they have like 40 clients and they're like well i think we can put them out in the field for now they shouldn't get too damaged overnight <laughs> flood comes and they lose hundreds of thousands of dollars of people's stuff i felt That's so it. bad too because that was a big lesson because like you i told like a bunch of people because i thought i was being helpful i didn't really know that much about i was a bookseller so i didn't know like you should gatekeep stuff like this or like not gatekeep but it like me yeah, like the reasons why you shouldn't tell someone to do something without you know working with someone for like i don't know more than six weeks i guess um <laughs> And then, yeah, I almost, I felt like CoffeeZilla, kind of, because I, like, broke this thing wide open, because I was the first one, because I was, like, I called the cops, and then I was getting, oh, my God, I get so many DMs every day, like, people asking for advice, like, how can, I was, like, call the cops, like, do a wellness check, check, and everyone, I don't know if they got their money back or what, but there are some people who had 50, 60 grand worth of stuff with them, and I was, like, fuck, geez. Yeah, gone. Like, it, I have to. I have to go through my phone and see. I definitely have the picture somewhere, but it was so. I don't think I posted them on Instagram, but I had them. I te I definitely texted them to some people, and I was like, oh "My God!" But yeah, it was literally just imagine a field and a trailer. Like imagine, um, I forgot what that movie is, but the guy with the chemist who like makes dope or whatever. Breaking Bad. <laughs> yeah, Breaking Bad. Like imagine where they used to make the dope. I just imagine like a bunch of Kohl's boxes and Target boxes like outside the trailer with some grass. That's so nuts. <laughs> but the, the biggest lesson really to take from all these stories and all these different things is no matter what happens, you need to be super meticulous with figuring out how much money you've actually lost and trying to recover it. I think that's been one of my biggest downfalls in this whole business is I've made so much money, but I've not been too like meticulous enough to track it all. And if you don't, you just end up not making any money because we're, we're running a business where the margins just inherently low because there's so much competition and they're just, it's an inventory based business. So they're shipping all these things where your margins five to 15%. That's like the average 50 on the super high end. Yeah. If you don't pay attention to these very meticulous things going on, you're going to lose money. Like you're not going to be profitable or you're just going to lose most of the money you make. I think that's just, that's just one of the downfalls of running an inventory based business. Like especially the Amazon one, you have to keep track of stuff. Cause when these big losses come and take you out, they take out everything. You know, one loss like that can negate a month, two months, three months of profit, yeah. Working whatever, 40, 50 hours a week. If you take one big loss, you've basically worked for zero dollars that past month. If you think about it like that, it's brutal. And then you have to pay tax and stuff. You you're you could be better off working at McDonald's. You know, you have one big loss in the year and you're just you should have worked at McDonald's or whatever it is. It, it's tough. I that stuff's the biggest deal with this this whole business. If you're not extremely organized and extremely meticulous about things, you're just gonna get wrecked. I think well, it's hard too it's hard one to track all this stuff. To some of the tests, obviously, like with the prep center having 20k worth of stuff, like that's not that hard to track because you have it. But you know, if Target towards you, like I don't know, fifty dollars in one order, right? Yeah, like do you really want to call Target? You know, it's gonna all of a sudden maybe they start looking into your account. It's like, well, is that worth it? I order a lot. Um, this is just a hypothetical situation. Uh, you know, like for someone like Kohl's, right? Like, do you really want them looking in to see like why the hell you're buying 4,000 pairs of socks to get $10 yeah. back? Right. Like, but then like you order enough, like $10 is a bad example, but let's say a hundred or $200 or they're sending you the wrong stuff times that by like a hundred orders. Like, well, there's five grand of nothing, <laughs> right? Five grand you paid for and you don't have goods for like, doesn't seem like a big deal until, like, it is a big deal. Um, I just think there's a lot of that. Like, returns is another one, right? Like, to get on the phone and try to get a hold of Kohl's, like, good luck, right? You That's 10 hours, like, yep. right there. And the outcome of getting what you want is probably pretty low as well. And same with the returns. Like, who the hell wants to take pictures for eBay, 
deal with people offering you half. I think the harder part with eBay, like it was exciting with books because you're making money on this stuff that you would probably recycle. But mm-hmm. for Amazon, you're listing something. You're you're trying to sell it on Amazon for seventy five. You're listing it on eBay for fifty. Someone's like, "Well, you take twenty five and you pay it like forty. It's yeah. just like, oh, this is so painful. It's like it's like, oh yeah, just get the money back. Like yeah, that's easy to say, but another, and then you have to ship it. Hope that they don't return it. Like because who knows on Amazon they obviously return it for a reason. Depending yeah. on what you're selling, like oh, does the thing even still work? Right? And then you end up like, oh, you know what, eBay person, just keep it. Now you're out shipping what they paid for it. It's just a massive problem. I feel like that could be the next big thing in this space is actually like someone who could do returns really well. Well, the, the problem is not profitable for the company, really. True. Yeah, they, that's why I, I know someone that runs a pretty big prep center, and he talks about the the labor and the the cost of doing all this stuff is just it's just not very profitable. That I think you could do it if you're doing like rev. Sh- if you do fifty fifty split. I almost think it would have to be, but you'd probably have to, but then there's no way to really route Amazon and be like, only send them, that I know of anyway, things that are $50 plus or whatever. Yeah, it just, I don't think it makes a lot of sense for the person doing it. It just be, it's a hard business to run. Logist, like doing that type of logistics stuff with retail type goods or whatever, sure, re- like sure. reselling, it's just hard. There's just lots of little nuances to everything, especially with how do they know if it's damaged? Like if it, if you get a controller, Xbox controller return, sure. how they going to know if it works? So the, there's so many. You need like every system to test the video game. Yeah. Like... Then isn't it even worth it. You know, it's like, sure. you, you, is it worth it to even test the goods? Yeah, it's, it's tough. That's. I think that's something that I, I honestly, after we've talked about all this, I don't remember another time where I've heard a lot of this stuff talked about. So if somebody's listening, you've made it this far into this, you really need to take a big look at what's going on in your business and, and try to audit it because I can, I preach that I'm not as good about it as I wish I was. But again, I just, I'm not that type of person really. I'm more of a move. Like if I lose the money, I move on type of person. I don't let it mess with my head, Mm -hmm. but if you can handle that, you need to be handling every single dollar that gets lost because that's where you're going to make all your money. If you can recover all the money, make sure you get the cash back, make sure stuff isn't lost, make sure that suppliers aren't shorting you. That's where like all your money is going to be made because no one else is doing that stuff. Like that's going to be a huge part of your margin, extra 3%, 5%, whatever it is. It could could be a hundred thousand dollar difference in your business. Yeah, for sure. Um, I have one more. Oh, do you have any other ones? I'm, I'm done. Rock and roll whenever you are. So my last one is, so when I was a bookseller, I think this could be a big one too, uh, is counterfeit books. So I remember being on vacation. It was like the first vacation I ever took. Uh, it was like a family vacation. We were in this like baller house in the Hamptons. It was amazing. And I was like, I was probably like three ish months away from being ready to like put in my notice at my job. Things were going great. And we finally get to the house. And of course I'm like checking my sales and I have like a message. I'm like, Oh God, it's so annoying. Like from a customer. And it was ONZ law firm, which is a huge counterfeit book selling like operation. They work with like the biggest publishers and they're like, you sold two counterfeit books. And I was like, what the hell? Like, I didn't even know counterfeit books were a thing. Like, that, like think, looking back now, like, it's supposedly, like, the biggest thing. I think there was a company called Textbook Rush, and it, they lost, like, a three or $400 million settlement. It, it was something so ridiculous. They basically, like, flooded the market with, like, fake textbooks from China. I'm pretty sure that was the company's name. And basically, it became a thing. And some of the biggest, like, takeaways from this is one never work with these companies these companies are such like scam artists so i paid them 1500 bucks they're like oh if you pay i think the charges it was like ten thousand dollars for counterfeit per copy luckily i only had two so they're like oh yeah it's gonna cost you 20 grand like we're gonna throw you they didn't say you put you in jail but like they're basically gonna be like fine you like what the hell do i know like supposedly copyright law or counter like it was a copyright infringement or I don't even know counter whatever, how it ever it is. It doesn't matter. So it's like, you can't be like, Oh, I didn't know it was counterfeit. Like how the law states it, it doesn't matter. Like there's no, Oh, I bought it from a shady. 
don't care. Like, your problem. Like, you sold it. There's no, like, retribution on anything. And these are used books, too. So there's really no supply chain. Like, I actually bought these off someone on Facebook Marketplace. Um, so that was, like, number one. It's just, like... So, number one, working with these people, it would have been better just to ignore them. And, like, not pay them or do anything like that. If that happened again today. They're no joke, though. So you would have to really stop selling, like, counterfeit. Well, I wasn't selling counterfeits. But, like, there are certain titles. It's usually the most valuable textbooks, like the newer textbooks, that are the uh -huh. most valuable. And that's kind of, like, opened my eyes to that. Uh, number two, um, if a brand or someone really wants you off Amazon, like, they're going to kick you off Amazon. Like, Amazon is not going to have your back. Uh, but over, if I recall correctly, supposedly these big textbook companies were trying to sue Amazon because of the counterfeit books. Uh, so Amazon wanted no part in that. They're like, you settle with the law. Like, we have nothing to do with this. Seller support's like, hey, we're not helping you. Like, it was just me versus the textbook company or their law firm. It didn't matter. They, they sent a letter. They're like, oh, if you pay us $1,500, we'll send you a letter. You'll be able to sell these textbooks. Like, I sent it to Amazon. They're like, no. Like, we're not recognizing this. Like, it was just a terrible experience. Um, and then the last thing is, like, there's counterfeits of everything. Like, it didn't really occur to me that there'd be counterfeit textbooks. Like, it's a book. Like, I just never thought of it. I was like, well, it's a $300 book. Right? There's $300 items they make. I'm sure there's $300 Nike shoes that are counterfeit, right? Yeah. But, like, it just never occurred to me that a textbook would be counterfeit or a book would be counterfeit. Um, so, yeah, and then we just had that whole thing um, with wholesalers selling counterfeit goods or, you know, sellers not knowing. So counterfeit is just a very big thing and just something to be on the lookout for. Like, this textbook situation wasn't like, oh, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. There actually was one situation. I remember I used to run these ads like, oh, I'll you know, I'll pay cash for textbooks or you search Craigslist, like selling textbooks or whatever you're doing. And I remember there's this one guy I was going to meet him. It was like two hours away. And it was just like that he had these books and we run through the ASINs and I was like, send me the ASINs. So he sends them I'm like, okay, like, let's just say it was a thousand bucks. Um, and the value of them, I mean, it was like almost spend a thousand, make a thousand. I'm like, oh, okay, like this is pretty good, you know, for textbooks or whatever. It was textbook season. And so I'm just like, all right, where do you want to meet? And then he got real weird. He was like, oh, I have a couple of copies. Like what? He's like, yeah, like of all of these, I have like five of each. Or if you want more, like I, I have a connection that could get me more. And I was like, well, like we, then in my head, I'm like, I was so new. I'm like, right, five grand for five. Like, that sounds like pretty good. Like, I'm never going to come across the opportunity like this again. And I, then I was like, huh, like, why are you selling them? Like, why wouldn't you just sell them on Amazon? He's like, well, like, you know, like my account, I don't know, like Amazon hates me or whatever. So they shut me down. So, you know, I have this connection or whatever. And I remember talking to Caleb Roth. I was like, what do you like think about this or whatever? He's like, dude, they're counterfeit. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, no one has five to 10 copies. Like, it's just impossible for that to be the case. And I was like, oh, that was like my first eye opening experience. I was like, that's how dumb I was. So I guess a lesson here is definitely reach out to people and be like, hey, does this seem shady? Or if the deal seems like way too good to be true, it's usually way too good to be true. Like, this isn't a sale at Walmart. That, like, something that's 20 is half off. This is, like, shady person being, like, ask questions. Be like, huh, why does Drew have 100? 10 copies of each book. Like, what? how do you even get those? How do you know that a textbook, like, what, what makes a textbook fake? So that's the biggest, that's the biggest scam and thing, too. So when you work with these companies, like, it was so ridiculous. I was like... Oh, my girlfriend, so she's a lawyer. She's like, okay, no problem. Like, show us why they're counterfeit. Why do you think they're counterfeit? Can we inspect them? Well, like, you got to come to our lab. 
and the labs only open like two hours on like Wednesday. Like we would have travel there, and they're like, "Well, if you're selling our books, like you should really have a library of textbooks, so you can check against the the book our books." So they're like, "Yeah, it'd be like ten grand a year, like." so ridiculous so basically they make it impossible but basically how you could tell is usually with the pages i don't have a book here but if you like uh flip the pages the numbers bounce so it's not like they'll bounce up and down so when you flip a normal book like you'll just see like two three four five six these would be like two three four yeah, like, it's, it's off that's a big sign another one's how it's glued a lot of the ones oh here's the book like here, like the glue would be like, there'd be a ton of glue right here. So it would just be like, it's poorly glued or like the binding, it would like easily split. So if you open the textbook and it just kind of like split, yeah. that would be a tall sign. Um, there used to be like a medical book. I don't know what the hell it is. I don't know. It was like this blue book. And supposedly that was like one of the most counterfeited ones. You could just tell uh, the barcode, some of the barcodes if you were using a phone or even um, a barcode scanner, it wouldn't scan because it was like such a hyper like in, enlarged or it just wouldn't scan it because it was like, I don't know, too slick or whatever. But yeah, you learn a ton from, I guess, getting in trouble. That one only cost me 1500 bucks, but that was a lot at the time. I was about to quit my job. I thought my business was going to go under. Because I had no problem selling books. It's not like I was an OA seller. I'm like, ah, oh, counterfeit. Like, who cares? Like, I'll submit the receipt. Those are like, no, we're suing you. <laughs> we're suing you for 20 grand. And I'm like, uh, that was like my emergency fund to leave my job. Like, this is not good um, <laughs> kind of thing. So, I mean, that was like probably one of the scarier moments. And then it's like, whoa, if I can't sell textbooks, like that's one of the most profitable parts of my business. Am I really still going to quit? It was just such a nightmare, but eventually I figured it out. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how these big losses, I bet, I mean, think about how many we have here. Imagine how many stories there are out there. What The funniest thing to me, and well, it's not even funny, it's kind of sad, but like you said, it, it puts your business under. I remember this kid on Twitter, this would be the final story I tell on here too, but th there was this kid on Twitter this was like a few months ago. I don't know how he's doing now because I usually just mute these guys that do this stuff because I just don't like it. But I was getting sent this guy's tweets all the time. And I'm like, I don't even – I've muted this kid three months ago. Stop sending me this guy. But everybody's like, look at the, how this is playing out. And by what, I, what I've gathered from this, and I don't really care to go back and fact check this. This might not be wrong, but I'm also not going to say the dude's name. So whatever. But it seemed like he was doing pretty well on Amazon and – encountered a really big loss so this was a 30 40 grand loss or whatever it was something that had went really wrong i don't exactly know what it was and i see two weeks later he drops this group that he's doing for whatever amount per month and him and his other friend racking all this money from the group and i bet he really thought oh i'm panicking right now because i've lost all this money that i've built up from this business let's just launch this group and try to collect as much cash as we can so a lot of the times if you see people, I, think I know on, exactly who you're talking about. I'm going to ask you. This happens a lot. Like th this whole thing could be switched with like so many different. I people. think I remember seeing, and I was like, "This mf -er. like yeah. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it." But every, every, there's a lot of times. Watch, watch how people's like watch their whole dialogue of what they're doing. You know, they they talk about these big losses, and then they come out with some type of info product afterwards. Never the people you want to like be around and buying stuff from. You want people that have, if they're putting some type of info product out, they have some type of group or coaching program or course. You want that to be someone who's been in the game a while and is continuously doing well and that type of thing. You don't want somebody who is down their luck and then they start pushing stuff in your face because that's usually going to be a subpar product for one and just a massive money grab. And if it, and they're just not going to put time into the product, it's probably not going to be very good. And yeah, I've noticed that. Awesome piece of garbage yeah yeah i see it all the time like that that's just one situation but a lot of the little and they never live you know most of those things die off because the product's not good and people go well, i just got like scammed by this person almost every group i've joined from twitter is like that that's why i'm such a big arbops fan is because those guys have been going for like three years 
They take big losses. They just don't even promote their stuff anymore. And I, I'm like, you guys should promote way more because you're the only group that has yeah. all these message logs, all these successful sellers, group calls every week. That's like a crazy group. So I'm a big fan of RBOPs. That's the only one that I actually push because every other one I've joined, it's just like trash. There's just so many trashy aspects to all of it. Yeah, it's always hard too because sometimes for me, I get like FOMO. I'm like, oh, I should probably have a Discord. Or this person making all this money, like they just started or whatever. And then you kind of learn stuff like this and you're like, yep, this is why I don't have one of those or I don't do this or don't rush into anything. And then the, a funny thing that I saw the other day, someone had like a picture of their driveway. It was just full of oh, like... Yeah, I saw that. yeah, and then some, some like one of these lead groups like jack the photo on twitter yeah. i was like where do you think all these things were in our discord and and someone like it's like no nah, like i'm not part of your discord dude like those leads aren't in there like how would you even know it's in here it's like these yeah. people are ruthless yeah you really gotta vet these people like selling big stuff it really you have to get on the phone with people but if they're selling a 40 dollar group it's difficult to even do that but and, and most people just don't even care to lose the money and just try i'll try stuff out for a lot of money and just try to see if i just get scammed or not really but you, these anonymous groups that come out here and post all these screenshots and stuff it's like dude that could all be edited like that it's just a bunch of marketing play in your face and for one that's illegal to make like big claims to do that and the fdc just cracked down on that one guy but that stuff's probably going to go more and more because it's just false marketing claims. False, you know, you're not allowed to do that kind of stuff. But that doesn't stop people. They'll still keep keep by doing that type of thing. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I feel like sometimes too is like, I think if you ever want to join a group, like give it a day. If, mm -hmm. if you want to be like, oh, like, because you're going to see, oh, like, oh, pe our group members got this Stanley Cup for $30 last week there was a price error and now it's selling for $500 like the Taylor Swift Stanley Cup there is no Taylor Swift Stanley Cup but that's basically what it is it's like well if you're in the group you missed out you're like oh man like I should have been in the group and then like you'll see if you read the tweets like oh like my order got canceled from the price error like I want to see a checkout and there's like one person who has successfully like checked it out and they're like oh this person is like it's such like, oh my God. It's, so yeah, it's just a bunch of like false marketing claims, really. I, I would be, if I was those guys that ran those type of groups, be very careful, especially with those the FTC. Money, though, but I don't have the stomach to do shit like that. Yeah. I mean, I well, just, I, it's just, you're just exposing yourself to a lot of risk. The way they market, you know, if you, if you market like our bops, they don't even really say to join. I don't even remember the last time I saw a tweet say to join our group. A lot of people. You told me about them. I was like, who the hell is this? Yeah. Like, oh, they use this. I'm like, <laughs> You know, I was like, I've never even heard of these people. I've never heard anyone from, you're like, trust me, just join. I'm like, all right, whatever. A hundred percent. We're going to have them on here sometime because I can oh, get oh, yeah. you guys that run it. And they, they have so much insight to share about Amazon. I should have, we should have had them on this time, but I'll get them on here eventually. They're cool guys too. Very educated on Amazon. They run circles around me. Very smart dudes. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I don't have any more horror stories if you want to close things out. Yeah, me either. And that's, I think that's a wrap for today. Um, like, subscribe. We're going to get this on uh, like Spotify and all that stuff. Uh, hopefully soon. But yeah, it'll be on YouTube. <laughs> Leave us a comment. Leave your horror story. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, and what you learned from it. And yeah, we'll see you in the next one, guys. Peace. Peace.